Fisheries. So we've already, we've already seen the example of whales, but let's talk more generally about fisheries. Now, before we get going, I want to start with a, a clarifying term. Fishery refers to a, a bunch of fish in an area that we would like to catch, primarily for food, but in theory it could be for some other purpose, turning into chicken fertilizer or something else. In practice, the term fishery or fisheries has come to refer to anything that we capture from an aquatic realm. So it need not necessarily refer to a vertebrate. It could refer to krill, could refer to abalone, could refer to uh, kelp for that matter, okay? So when we hear the term fishery, it's, it's something you are fishing for. It's not necessarily a a chordate. Cool? Okay. So the, the vast majority of fisheries are indeed for fish, but, but realize the, the term is, is applied more generically than that. Okay? And here you're seeing one of these uh, great, uh, wonderful magic things of evolution called a tuna. And they are uh, an amazing critter that can, depending on the species, could possibly swim across the Pacific. Uh, over the course of a couple months, um, or if the conditions are right, maybe even over the course of a couple weeks. Amazingly wide-ranging, uh, far-traveling critter. So we'll see how far we get today. We might not get to all this. I wasn't planning on starting this today, but, but I want to start with some historical perspectives and then going, go into uh, current stuff and uh, talk about some of the different uh, approaches to managing fishery resources. History is important. Now, why, why, did my, why might we care about history, you guys? The historical conditions. Okay, to predict the future, possibly. So if we knew where we were, maybe we know where we're going. Okay, what else? So if we made an error, so maybe we, we learn what we did incorrectly so we can avoid that in the future, possibly. Okay, good. Good, so uh, some kind of rule stick, a ruler, to figure out, are we flush with fish right now, let's say? Are, are fish the way they've always been? Are fish but a fraction of what they used to be? That kind of thing. So we have some measure of our impact or the efficacy of our management practices. Cool. Other ideas? Yeah, so that's pretty good. So um, I would just say that, uh, that here are some reasons why history, uh, historic perspectives at least, are generally useful to us broadly, not necessarily just for fisheries. But um, obviously they help frame our current situation. It's much different if we are 90% of what we used to have versus if we're 9% of what we used to have versus if we're 9 tenth of a percent of what we used to have, right? You might choose different actions. You might have different urgencies behind those actions if, uh, you know, depending on the level that we find ourselves in. Uh, as you guys said, it, all, it tells us our story of how we got here. Right? It helps us explain um, the path we took to where we are right now in our world. One of the most common answers that you guys didn't give, but one of the most common answers is number three up here, which is uh, giving us some kind of guidance, a target, if you will. So we used to have 300 whales off the Channel Islands at any given minute. Well, now we're only at 60. So therefore, if we had a, a well-functioning stock of whales, we would choose a ma we might choose a management action that would produce more whales, right? So we get to where we're going to. If we then discovered that we had 310 whales around the Channel Islands, maybe we'd say, okay, we're good enough. We don't need to do those active, active measures to encourage more whale uh, breeding or whatever it might be. And then one that we'll touch on uh, first here is, is this notion to illuminate that we've been actually interacting with these fishery resources for a long, long time. It is very easy to fall into the trap of me showing you pictures of 
commercial fishing vessels and talking about inventions since World War II and this and that, to think that we really started our, our significant impact in the last few decades. And clearly the last few decades have had major impacts on our fishery resources. But we've been impacting these resources for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So the historical perspective can help, help us understand that, right? Help us understand that. Uh, just a quick note on number three here. Uh, you guys agree? Anybody, anybody in our introduction to restoration ecology class this semester? One? Theory of practice. Theory of practice, yeah. Two? Okay. Have you guys talked about historic baselines at all in that class? So, so in general, do you think um, history, uh, we should use history, and I'll, I'll open this to everybody. Should we use history as a guide? I, I just gave you an example. Hey, maybe we had X number of whales off the islands. Should that be the guide? <laughs> okay, so, so, so maybe. So Finn says maybe, but it depends. Okay, so Kevin's saying that say it's, there's, there's, there's many things that, that vary. So what you're saying is maybe history isn't a guide then. So you don't think history is important. At least in the at least in the context at least in the context of <laughs> in the context of of a gu guidance for some management activity, you'd say it's not that helpful then. Okay, so, ready? Well, yeah, theory of practice. All right. Okay, there we go. I, f I have a vote for totally is important. Okay, so so tell us why it's totally important. Uh, because you need to understand how the system has worked before. Hmm. Okay, so, so history provides us uh, maybe some measure of disturbance in the system or how tweaked the system has become. And maybe we want a healthy system and not a tweaked system. So history might be important in that sense of, of figuring this stuff out. Okay? Any, any other thoughts? Okay, let's look at, let's look at a little bit of data here. So this is some data, this is an old slide, but um, I took this from uh, a colleague who uh, uh, passed away several years ago now. Um, but uh, anyway, this is different abalone landings. So first, before we get into it, let me, just, let me just do a little bit of orientation. Landings, what is that? Landings with regards to fisheries. That means you and I are out in our boat and we're out cruising and we're, we're catching things, and maybe we caught 300 tuna, okay? Most of the accounting, traditionally, for uh, how many fish we're, we're catching happens at the dock. While it is possible now to actually do, do that accounting at the point of actual capture, that rarely happens, right? That, that, that's a really technologically sophisticated approach, and that's, generally speaking, not done. Instead, you and I catch our fish, we have lunch, we put everything in the hold, we pull in the nets and the lines and the everything, and then we turn around and then we put, 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 put back to the port. And then the port is where we get rid of our fish, where we offload our fish. And that is usually, I as the fisherman, we as the fishermen, um, uh, that's where, actually, I'm, I'll talk about the term fisherman in a second too, but that's where we offload our stuff, and usually we offload it to a seller, right? So we're going to sell it to this person, maybe it's a cannery, maybe it's a distributor that's going to take the fish to Vaughn's and Safeway and the stores and, you know, Ralph's and everywhere. Um, so, so I'm therefore going to sell to you, and then when I sell to you, that's the point of making the record, right? So for the purposes of how many fish I sold, for the purposes of how much income I made, that kind of stuff, that happens at the dock. So we typically refer to that as the landings, right? So we've landed at the port, and that's what we're, that's what we're offloading. As we'll see, I mean, that, that makes total sense, right? I mean, you got to do it at some point, that's cool. But one of the things that has masked historically 
is maybe you and I caught those 300 tuna. Maybe we also caught 600 shark in the process of trying to get those tuna, right? And then we're like, damn, either I don't want shark or, oh, damn, that's illegal. Don't tell anybody about the shark, right? So we kind of let those sharks go. We call that bycatch, incidental take, things that we weren't, either weren't intending to catch or can't use. We sort of like get rid of those dudes, right? Out in the middle of the ocean, nobody's seeing me. And so when we return, and we re return with whatever, 300 fish, it looks like, oh, we caught 300 fish, even though we might have actually caught 1,000 fish. So um, there wasn't necessarily anything nefarious in the creation of the system, but just realize we've inherited this data system from, from back in the day. Maybe we didn't fully understand some of the potential downsides of this approach. Brittany. Probably not. So the question is, so, so what if we're out at sea and we're like, damn, I'm going to have myself some sashimi, right? And we cut up one of those dudes. Um, it depends on the regulatory body, depends on where we are on the earth. In theory, we probably should have said that we caught that tuna. In reality, people probably don't say that, right? They probably just report what we, what we return to the seller, what we return to port. Now we do have Entities called fish, and, and for example, in, in the U.S. context, we do have, th in some other countries, we have some things called fishery observers, where we might have a, a, a representative of a regulatory body or agency on our boat with us. And he or she is sitting there watching these fish come onto the ship, and they're making notes, right? There are some potential problems with that. But in theory, that person is there to corroborate that indeed this, these individuals were caught. And if there's bycatch, how much bycatch? But that's, that's a small fraction of the global um, fishing effort. Okay, uh, one other, just since we're getting into, since we're getting into uh, some terminology here. So, okay, this is landings on the left. And this is, MT is in metric tons. So a lot of times we don't express the the fish we catch by the number of individuals, but rather by the biomass, by the weight. Okay, so it's usually expressed as some tons, millions of tons, that kind of stuff, um, in term, rather than individual number of organisms. Uh, just as I mentioned it, one more term, I'm not trying to be sexist here, fish, fishermen. So I have several friends that, are, that fish for a living who are female. And uh, we, we, generally speaking, tr tend now use the term fisher folk, <laughs> gender neutral. I'll just say that my friends that are uh, women that are fishermen get really pissed off when I use that term. They call themselves fishermen, and they don't see it as a sexist term. They see it as a, as a term they like to use. So, so I'm not trying to take sides there. I'm just saying um, you can use whichever term you like to be gender neutral. Understand that most, traditionally most, across the planet, most fisher folk historically are male. But um, anyway, so fishermen, when if I say fishermen, I'm not trying to imply just men. I'm implying people that go out and fish. Okay. All righty. Okay, so here we go. So, so let's look at this. So here is, so this is a typical example of some harvest data. In this case, we've harvested abalone. Who here has eaten abalone? Man. So I, I, I will post some videos for us. Um, that's, that's a, that, that makes me very sad. That makes me sad that you guys haven't tasted abalone. When I was in graduate school, one of the ways we ate, we, we survived out on the islands, was eating white sea bass, eating lobster, eating abalone. Mm, right. <laughs> so. Uh, now, I mean, well, th this discussion will come a little bit later, but, but the point is, um, this is the story of our modern fishery. Yeah, like, this is different. This is a mollusk. So abalone is a single-shelled uh, snail. They live from the intertidal to the shallow subtidal. Here in California, we have seven different species of abalone. And uh, real quickly, when I was young, um, younger than you guys, when I was a little kid, so I grew up in Northern California, my family, every, every um, 
year would go up for a week or so, like where the fires are burning now, basically, sort of north of San Francisco. And we would go up and we would uh, collect abalone for the family for the year. So it was, it was sort of sex segregated and age segregated harvest. And so the men, because they're men, uh, they'd go down in the intertidal and they would pop these abalones. So these abalones are stuck to rocks and they're feeding off of algae, detrital algae, floating pieces of algae. So they would go down with uh, what's called an iron and pop these guys off the rock. These guys are really good. It's, it's a big giant muscle and they hold on. And that big muscle is really, really strong because they have to fight against the waves pounding against them and stuff. And so that really, really strong meat is what, what you eat when you eat abalone. You eat the foot, you eat the, the, the musculature. And so the guys would go down, pop them, and then the kids, we would run down, and we would pick them up, and we would run them up the cliffs. Then up at the campsite, we'd have picnic tables, and that, that's where all the women were. And the women would, would clean the abalone and then pound it. So usually, I mean, not to say we did, but normally people would drink a lot of beer, and they'd drink the beer, and they'd use the beer bottle as the tenderizer. And so, so the idea, we had needed to do that because some of the species, the mussels are very thick. And you could, you could, of course, cook whatever you want, but it's really chewy, right? So the idea is you tenderize it, you beat it, you pound it like you would some really sort of nasty beef, like, right? You know, you kind of, some, some, some cuts of beef you have to pound, 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 pound to make it uh, edible. And so you'd pound, 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 and then we'd, we'd throw those so-called steaks, like about the size of your hand, throw those steaks into the freezer, and then at the end of the week, we'd divvy them up. And then everybody, that's what we, and we didn't eat them every day, but, but that would be in the freezer, and if we would want abalone, that's what we'd eat. That will, at least in the near future, will, my son will never experience that, you guys will never experience that. This is the story of a poorly managed fishery. So let's look at what's going on here. So each of these colors corresponds to different species of abalone. Uh, generally speaking, the ones that were harvested first are the most tender. The ones that you needed to either not pound at all or pound the least. And then once we eat all the candy, or once we eat all the ice cream, then we go to eat the candy. And then once we have the candy, then we eat the hamburgers. And then we eat the hamburgers, then we go to vegetables, right? We kind of work our way through what we think is the most desirous. And that's what happened here. So have a look. So this graph starts in 1960. We could push it back even further, but for purposes of our intro discussion here, this makes sense. So we started, and check it out. We started harvesting a lot of the red. The red is our red abalone. Then those guys started to crash. As their numbers crash, you guys can see the, the arc starting to uh, arc down. Then we started, we switched to pink abalone. Pink abalone are found much deeper. In, in, on uh, maybe they might be at 60 feet, 70 feet uh, or so. Uh, they could be shallower. But check it out. We start harvesting those guys, and then those guys go up. And then, and then those guys tank. And then we switch to another resource. We'll talk about this more in a second, but we can refer to that as cereal depletion. So we deplete the, the easiest to get at thing. We saw this with whales as well. We, we, we attack the ones that are easiest to get, close to shore, um, cost us the least amount of effort, get those. And then we switch to the one that's the next closest, the next cheapest, the next easiest, whatever the case may be. Is this based on the entire US or just California? This is just California data right here on the left, or on, the, on this figure. This is just California data. So, um, so what we see is, we see uh, from a historical perspective, on the left side, big numbers, yeah? On the right side, more recent or indeed current times, not so many numbers, right? One last bit of orientation here to this, this is landings. A lot of times we look at this data and we say, oh my God, there used to be a crap load of abalone back in whatever, 1960, if we take the red line, right? And we trace the red line forward, oh my God, now there's no, there's no red. You need to be careful of that. This is not scientific objective surveying counting, right? This is the number of individuals we caught. So two possible problems with that. Maybe we just decided to stop catching them. Maybe we passed some law that said you can't catch them. So landings could go down for a variety of reasons. With me? The other thing that is very easy to be misled by these types of figures 
is, is uh, even if we accept that, even if we accept we didn't change the law, we didn't change the management uh, rules, we didn't change the fishing technology, we may well have changed our fishing effort. So I think when you guys tend to look at this, you tend to think of the type of data that you and I typically collect. We run a transect out in the forest, we drop a quadrat, and we count the number of, of individuals inside that quadrat or inside that band transect, yeah? Standardized, that's why, that's why we train you guys, you standardize, standardize, standardize. Many times, these, this fishery data is not standardized. So what you'll see, in a, rather, what's much better than landings, in most cases, is a thing called CPU. That stands for catch per unit effort. And so that tries to standardize, were there 100 fisher folk going after these abalone? Was there 1,000? Was there 500 in 1970? and 3,000 in 1980 and, and the like. You guys with me? So landings, raw landings data are not standardized by the effort put out there. Okay? Even though it's very easy to look at these graphs and assume we're talking about the wild population and assume that we've been measuring that consistently. Yeah? Okay. So serial depletion. Uh, so two, two themes here. Serial depletion. We were switching from one species, one one target to another as their numbers decline. And then two, there used to be a lot, now there's less. Okay? Uh, just real quick to finish this, we'll, we'll probably get back to this, but um, we've had a moratorium on harvesting any abalone for recreational or commercial fishing in, in uh, Southern California since 1997. So now not only uh, would it be, is it hard to get abalone? It's illegal to get abalone. The only place you can get them now legally in the state of California is north of San Francisco, only recreationally, only on, only free diving. You're not allowed to use scuba or hookah or anything like that. So, um, okay, all right. This story about abalone is not unique to abalone, it's not unique to California. Here are a few different uh, graphs I've pulled together from different, different fish, different parts of the world. What do they have in common? If you squint, they all start up high on the left and they all go down. Why would the year be different on like the starting year? Uh, it's what the date I grabbed. Yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it's a similar pattern. We see this over and over again. So look at a quick video here, but this is uh, one example of some harvesting of tuna. This is a, a traditional harvest method that's done in the Mediterranean. It's not how we do it uh, here in, in the Pacific typically, but um, let's have a look at, um, let's have a look at these guys. <laughs> 